Victoria's deadliest day since the pandemic began. And new warnings its aged care system is on the brink. China makes its move, ordering the closure of a U.S. consulate. A U.S. mayor accuses Donald Trump of urban warfare as he's tear gassed at a Black Lives Matter rally. And Behrouz Bouchani, the author who became a voice for Manus Island detainees, is given a new start in New Zealand. This is SBS World News with Anton Enos. Good evening. Seven deaths in 24 hours. Victoria's de de deadliest day of the pandemic so far, and tonight there's more bad news. The state's chief health officer warns with cases so high, the death toll is likely to keep rising every day for the next few weeks. Victoria recorded another 300 infections overnight. New South Wales reported 11 new cases, Queensland two. Of the new deaths, most are linked to aged care facilities. The most vulnerable of facilities has become a frightening example of just how infectious coronavirus is. Last week, St Basil's Home for the Aged had nine cases. Today, it has 73. Nicholas Barbousas has two family members inside. One is his 79-year-old father, Paul, who's awaiting a test. So where we stand right now, I'm not sure what his status is. He's in his, I know he's in his room. Um, I know they're all locked in their rooms, the ones that are in the facility. Of the seven fatalities overnight, five were elderly Victorians infected in aged care. The sector's peak body says some facilities are struggling with a lack of PPE and staff. Aged care in Victoria is on the brink and we need more help. We have had some help and support from the government and we really appreciate that, but we need more help. 300 healthcare workers are currently infected with coronavirus. That includes staff in aged care and hospitals. The Department of Health and Human Services won't say how many more have been forced into self-isolation. The Australian Medical Association says more needs to be done to ease the pressure on the system. A move to further restrictions would send a powerful message to all Victorians that this is a very serious situation. I've got no advice to move to uh, a so-called stage four or, 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 to, or to change those rules. The state's chief health officer says he hopes newly mandated masks will be enough to help bring numbers down soon. I think you can go to a very, very broad uh, shutdown. Um, it will have its own harms. Uh, and it may not turn around uh, the transmission because of where we're seeing the transmission occurring. The Premier says a quarter of positive cases are not answering their phones for contact tracing interviews. The ADF and police now set to follow up in person. If they don't answer in the phone, we'll knock on the door. If they don't come for testing, we'll drive a truck to the end of the street and we'll test them there. And advice for expectant parents was clarified today after the health minister said yesterday that partners or support persons would have to leave hospital two hours after a baby's birth. That's no longer the case. If a support person or partner stays continuously, there is no limit in the time uh, that that person can stay. Some relief in an overwhelmingly anxious time. Let's go live now to SBS reporter Rachel Carey in Melbourne. And just a reminder that broadcasters are exempt from wearing masks while reporting. Rachel, good evening. Another big jump in daily cases we're reporting tonight. Are Victorians heeding the health advice? Good evening, Anton. Again, an overwhelming majority of Victorians are listening to the health advice. But Victoria Police says in the 24 hours till this morning, it issued 101 fines for people who were breaching the Chief Health Officer's directives. That's the largest number of fines in a single day that we've seen during this second lockdown. Now, I did mention yesterday we shouldn't expect too many of these fines to be for Melburnians who are still getting used to wearing their masks. But Victoria Police says it did issue 16 fines for that uh, over the last 24 hours but that was mainly for people who had been offered a mask by officers and still refused to wear it. That is Rachel Carey updating us live from Melbourne.
South Australia is ramping up its border controls with Victoria, banning anyone, including its own residents, from entering the state as of midnight Tuesday. The change comes as New South Wales and Queensland also impose tougher restrictions to help curb the spread of COVID-19. Hospital staff and paramedics in New South Wales ordered to wear masks within one and a half metres of patients. From today, patients and hospital visitors must also wear a mask if possible. Health officials say the new measure is needed to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Community transmission continues and New South Wales Health is calling on people across the state to redouble their efforts to stop the virus spreading. The decision welcomed by the nurses' union. The New South Wales government says at this stage, mandatory mask wearing won't be extended to other workplaces such as hospitality. That's the current advice from health, but again, uh, the virus constantly changes and, uh, and the government needs to change accordingly. Ten new cases in the state were linked to the Thai Rock restaurant in Western Sydney. The cluster leading to the closure of three local Catholic schools after four students tested positive. New restrictions, including a 10-person limit on group bookings, are also now in force at restaurants, cafes and other venues in New South Wales. We've actually lost quite a few uh, large bookings. Authorities vowing to name and shame businesses caught breaking the rules. Uh, the time, I guess, is over for excuses. A meeting of National Cabinet reaffirming Australia's suppression strategy with the ultimate aim of no community transmission. And that's certainly where we want to get back to in Victoria and New South Wales and that's where our efforts are focused. To really demonstrate how aggressively we need to chase down every case every day uh, to ensure they are isolated. As Victoria continues to try and contain its growing outbreaks, South Australia is ramping up its border controls with the state. From midnight on Tuesday, no one will be able to enter from Victoria, even South Australian residents. We've got to do everything we can now uh, to protect ourselves. Funerals and weddings will also be capped at 100 people and home gatherings will be reduced to 50 people. In Queensland, patrons at pubs and clubs must once again be seated at tables. Health officials say they're also concerned about residents travelling interstate. I really think this is a time for people to think twice before they travel interstate to either um, New South Wales or Victoria. If they go to Victoria, they'll have to quarantine when they come back. Despite no new cases in Western Australia, the final stage of restrictions will no longer be eased next month, the Premier defending the decision as being unashamedly cautious. Cassandra Bain, SBS World News. Let's check Tasmania now. It's opening up again to South Australia, Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Let's cross live now to SBS reporter Sarah Maunder, who is in Hobart. Sarah, how is this travel bubble going to work? That's right. So Tasmania will reopen its borders in two weeks to South Australia, Northern Territory and WA. So from that date, arrivals from those three states will be required to do a mandatory health check on arrival at the airport, which will involve a temperature check. Now, if any of those arrivals are showing symptoms of COVID-19, they will have to do a mandatory COVID-19 test at the airport. Uh, refusal to do that test could result in two weeks of quarantine in a hotel or being sent back on the next available flight home or back to where they came from. Now, uh, going on from that, um, obviously, um, now, uh, today's decision to reopen the borders, the Premier Peter Gutwin said it, uh, to reopen the borders to South Australia, Northern Territory and WA, the Premier Peter Gutwin said it won't bring much of a boost to Tasmania's struggling tourism sector. Uh, about 85% of Tasmania's tourism comes from the eastern states, so that's Victoria and New South Wales. However, today's announcement is about keeping Tasmanians safe and it's unlikely uh, Tasmania's borders will reopen to Victoria anytime soon. Here's what the Premier had to say. Tasmania is one of the safest places on the planet and in public health's view, so are South Australia, the Northern Territory and Western Australia, which are equally as safe. 
Now, the WA Premier Mark McGowan uh, earlier today said that WA will not return this favour. Uh, WA will keep its borders closed to Tasmanians wishing to travel to that state. So uh, South Australia and Northern Territory have been open to Tasmanians for a short time now. So today's announcement really does mean that uh, there is free travel between these three states. That is SBS reporter Sarah Maunder updating us live from Hobart. With Australia's population growth set to fall to a 100-year low, the Treasurer has endorsed a baby boom and migrant-led recovery. Josh Frydenberg says the global economy has never experienced a contraction as big as COVID-19, but insists austerity is not the answer. Populate or perish. Today, migrant ships are bringing new settlers to Australia. Australia's catch cry in the wake of World War II. Migrants will not make a shortage of jobs. They will make more jobs. Echoed amid a pandemic and the biggest economic crisis since. Annual population growth is assumed to slow to just 0.6% in 2021, the lowest rate since 1916-17. Josh Frydenberg knows it's a homegrown challenge too, stopping short of his predecessor. One for your husband and one for your wife and one for the country. <laughs> offering his own paternal and patriotic plea. The more children um, that we have across the country, uh, together with our migration, we'll build our population growth and that will be good for the economy. Well, uh, you, you, you can't impose uh, these things. Uh, what you can do is make sure that you have an economic environment uh, that's conducive. The government's recovery plan banking on two big assumptions. The nation's borders will reopen on New Year's Day. And Melbourne's lockdown will only last six weeks. If secondary outbreaks are contained, Treasury expects around half of those that lost their jobs or who were stood down on zero hours early in the crisis will be back in some form of work by the end of the year. The government expects unemployment north of 9% by Christmas. The government expects 240,000 Australians to join those unemployment queues between now and Christmas. The Prime Minister pointing to another set of numbers. The effective rate of unemployment back in April was around 15 per cent. It fell to 13.9 per cent in May and it fell to 11.3 per cent in June. That shows the improvement in the labour market. Facing a global contraction the Treasurer says is 60 times the size of the global financial crisis. Australia's fortunes ride on growing economies that are yet to reopen. Fiscal discipline, not austerity. We're rejecting the austerity. Jobs and new Australians, both in short supply. For at least 20 to 30 years, that skilled migration policy has been really critical to Australia's population. So I don't think there's much uh, reality to the, uh, or the old myth that migration equals job loss. Brett Mason, SBS World News. Coming up next, America's top infectious diseases expert takes a break from the pandemic, but it's the US president who's been accused of missing the mark once again. Why a former Nazi guard won't spend any time behind bars. And Coon Cheese to change its brand name over racism concerns. Tonight at 7.30, Secrets of the Railway. Then at 9.30, Mary Beard invokes new ideas about gender, sex and moral transgression in a bare-all two-part documentary, Mary Beard's Shock of the Nude. Your people are victims. How can you reconcile that in your head? We're going to tell this story. We're going to tell it right. We will change the course of history. SBS presents a series of films and documentaries all about making history. Starts tomorrow, 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. First victim's Paul Redford. This isn't random, is it? It's going to be more. You do remember how many crimes you've committed together? 
A new season of Luther starts Wednesday 9.30 on SBS and On Demand. At Harvey Norman, get 60 months interest free and receive a bonus gift card up to the value of $500. Enjoy perfect pizza at home. Breville Smart Pizza Oven, just $1,249. Step up to QLED technology with this Samsung 65-inch 4K Smart TV. Now under two grand. High Sense 8kg front load washer plus 8kg heat pump dryer. Hot package price, save $100. Get 60 months interest free with a bonus gift card up to $500. Now at Harvey Norman. So we've got, like, car payments, rent. You lose us budgeting again? <laughs> we can finance if we, if we want, want to. to. We can leave our friends behind. Get on top of your money. With ANZ's Financial Wellbeing Check-In. Does your energy provider chip in for your internet? Dodo does. Yep, we're an energy company and an internet company, which is why you get unlimited data on our NBN 50 plan for just 60 bucks a month when you also get electricity and gas. Switch at dodo.com. Oh, wow. I thought you were dead. Oh. Well, I promised my manager I wouldn't get into any more trouble. Do the opposite of that. I had no idea we'd be trying to escape from the cops. I don't have my driver's license. What was that? I think it was Harvey Weinstein. You drew a deadly snake at a fifth grade teacher, <laughs> attempted to beat up two children, and knocked out a nun. Just try and behave. I'll try. Someone was murdered in this house? Was it the decorator? Oh. Any for your thoughts? I was wondering when you'll die. You son of a... Is he the only one, or have there been others? I need to buy a gun. You still want to make love to me? Yeah. I'm not dying anytime soon. You don't know that? Keep one eye open, honey. Better watch your back. I wanted to scrub my skin white. Growing up, mixed race. I thought I had to pick a side. My mother was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, very pale-skinned lady. I was told you're too pretty to be Aboriginal. Kind of don't really belong anywhere. Then, on the feed, the weirdest... I didn't see anything wrong with it. ...possibly greatest museum heist in history. Full-size lines. And it happened right here. Insight, followed by The Feed. Tuesday from 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. China has made good on its promise to retaliate against the US over the closure of its consulate in Houston, Texas. In what's being seen as tit-for-tat diplomacy, Beijing has now ordered a US consulate in Chinese, in, on Chinese soil to close. The gates to the US consulate in the Chinese city of Chengdu are shut for now, but Beijing has ordered America's diplomats inside to leave. The current situation in bilateral relations is not what China desires to see, and the US is responsible for all this. It follows yesterday's commotion at the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas, when Chinese officials scrambled to burn sensitive documents after Washington ordered the expulsion of 60 diplomats and their families amid allegations the Houston consulate was a Chinese spy factory. I have absolutely no doubt that the, the consulate was being used as a platform to enable Chinese spying. And Washington has continued to level even more spying allegations at China, accusing four scientists, including this woman, Tang Wan, a visiting Chinese cancer researcher at the University of California, of being a member of China's armed forces. Charged with visa fraud, the FBI says Ms Tang is hiding out and evading arrest at the Chinese consulate in San Francisco. Despite photos of her in uniform, the US Department of Justice alleges she denied serving in the Chinese military and claimed she didn't know the meaning of the insignia on her uniform. US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo taking aim at China, invoking the words of a past president to describe the current situation. President Nixon once said he feared he had created a Frankenstein by opening the world to the CCP. And here we are. 
Mr Pompeo urged freedom-loving nations of the world to induce China to change, saying Beijing's actions are threatening people and prosperity. The escalation in language comes as experts speculate about what's likely to come of rising tensions between the two superpowers. I think we're very clearly in the early stages of a Cold War between the US and China, really between the Western democracies and China. Predictions of an increasingly volatile relationship ahead. Felicity Davy, SBS World News. Let's go live now to our reporter Patrick Fock in Beijing. Uh, good evening, Patrick. We understand that uh, China has made specific accusations about US personnel at the Chengdu consulate. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's, that's right, Anton. The precise words of the Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Bin was that personnel at the uh, consulate in Chengdu were engaged in uh, activities that were inconsistent with their capacity and that they were interfering with internal affairs of China and endangering national security. What that means could be absolutely anything. But twice Wang said that the Americans were crystal clear on what that was about and said that the Chinese had made representations with the Americans about it as well. Uh, now, the other issue uh, about that in particular is that a lot of analysts suspect that the reason, one of the reasons why Chengdu was closing chosen for its closure uh, was because it covered, among many other regions, Tibet. And that is, of course, uh, a region that has been a point of contention between Washington and Beijing. And the, Amer and the Chinese may have felt it necessary to raise this issue in particular to highlight activities uh, being undertaken by the Americans, which supposedly undermine China. And much uh, like the Americans have been highlighting alleged espionage activities that undermine the U.S. And speaking of the foreign ministry, it insists it's committed to a policy of no conflict and mutual respect with the U.S. Is that, would you say, consistent with Beijing's latest actions? Well, it's interesting that you make that point about conflict because there was an article in the South China Morning Post discussing that particular point and it had concluded essentially that any likelihood of conflict was slim because of the trade links between the two countries just being absolutely vital. And on your second point, a lot's also been made about whether or not this move to close the consulate in Chengdu is an equivalent and reciprocal countermeasure. There's been talk, of course, uh, about whether or not the, the consulate in Wuhan would be closed, but it was decided that because a lot of the U.S. personnel were missing because they'd left the country, essentially, because of the coronavirus outbreak in, in Wuhan, this was meant to be uh, an equivalent uh, countermeasure, if you like. Notably, uh, one of the things that has developed over the last 24 hours as well is that the Consulate General of uh, Houston has said that he may defy the order to close down and said that the Consulate there would remain open and carry on as it would normally. Uh, that suggests that the Chinese are perhaps hoping that the Americans may still pull back, but given the circumstances that we're in and the level of animosity that we've seen from both sides, it would appear, from the outside at least, that that would be unlikely. Thanks, Patrick. That is Patrick Falk updating us live from Beijing. Donald Trump has cancelled the Republican Party convention in Florida as coronavirus cases in the United States surged past 4 million. The Centers for Disease Control is predicting deaths could exceed 170,000 by the middle of next August. On yet another day of more than a thousand COVID-19 deaths, President Trump taking to the podium to reassure America. This is a copy of the map, and this is, uh, you have it right behind me. The Northeast has become very clean. The country is in very good shape, other than if you look south and west some problems that'll all work out the nation's leading infectious diseases expert given the honor of throwing the ceremonial first pitch as baseball resumed dr fauci's aim well off course but it's the rhetoric of the president that maryland's republican governor finds misguided it seemed as if the president was doing downplaying it and saying uh, you know this virus is going to disappear it's 15 people and soon it will be none after the first confirmed case on January 20, it takes more than three months to reach one million on April 28. 43 days later, the two millionth case on June 10. Less than a month later, three million on July 7. 
and it takes just two weeks to pass through 4 million today. California reporting its worst 24-hour period for new cases and fatalities. We need to assume that COVID-19 is everywhere right now. In Florida, Miami's mayor advocating the use of masks in the home. I want to urge everyone to understand that when you get home, you are not necessarily safe. Next month, Florida was to have hosted the Republican convention. The event just as occurred four years ago in Ohio when the party formally nominates its candidate, designed to spark momentum. Not this year. And I'll still do a convention speech in a different form. Democratic rival Joe Biden releasing a conversation with former President Barack Obama. It is hard to fathom anybody wanting to take away people's health care in the middle of a major public health crisis. And offer nothing. At a time when unemployment is in double digits. U.S. unemployment claims rising last week for the first time in three months as the national crisis and grief deepens. 13 nuns at a single convent in Michigan dying from COVID-19. But amid the horror, a little hope. People were dying all around me, and I didn't die. The retired school teacher making it home after 128 days in hospital. Pruluan SBS World News. Back home, Prime Minister Scott Morrison says any country that makes a breakthrough on a coronavirus vaccine must share it with the world. After discussing the matter with his French counterpart, Mr Morrison said he'd expect like-minded countries to share the information, describing it as an absolute obligation. And any country uh, that would, would hoard a, a vaccine uh, a discovery, I, I think, uh, would... Uh, would not uh, be met with welcome arms by the rest of the world. The PM said Australia's Doherty Institute was held to the standard by making the first genetic reproduction of the virus globally available. Operators of the Ruby Princess have been hit with a class action from families and passengers impacted by the cruise ship's deadly COVID-19 outbreak. Shine Lawyer says it's lodged a compensation claim against Carnival PLC and Princess Cruise Lines Limited in the federal court. More than 2,500 passengers disembarked from the ship in Sydney in March. The incident linked to hundreds of coronavirus infections and more than 20 deaths. It's alleged the companies were misleading, deceptive and failed to properly protect those on board. Passenger Graham Lake, whose wife Carla later died in hospital, has joined the action. I was admitted in the same hospital about three, four days after Carla. I was in the ward with her when she died. Shine Lawyers says it's already received calls from 800 passengers and is expecting more to come forward. In a statement, Princess Cruises said it had the utmost respect for guests, families and crew impacted, but declined to comment on the action. The US federal forces criticised for their heavy-handed tactics against protesters in Portland are tonight under investigation by the Justice Department watchdog. It comes as they tear-gassed Portland's mayor, Ted Wheeler, while he was attending a demonstration. He says President Donald Trump is using the agents as his own personal militia to conduct urban warfare. Portland is peaceful tonight, but the Black Lives Matter protesters are still determined to be heard. They've turned out in large numbers for the 56th straight night. It was a vastly different scenario last night. This is the city's mayor, caught up in a cloud of tear gas thanks to the Department of Homeland Security's crackdown. This is not a de-escalation strategy. This is flat-out urban warfare. And it's being brought on the people of this country by the President of the United States. And it's got to stop now. President Trump responded to the mayor's discomfort with this. He made a fool out of himself. Liz. He wanted to be among the people, so he went into the crowd and they knocked the hell out of him. And he's promising more will be done to make cities safe again, in line with his new law and order campaign. We've been doing it, and you've been seeing what's happening all around the country. We've just started this process, and frankly, we have no choice but to get involved. More than 40 arrests were made by federal forces last night. The multi-agency force made headlines for being heavy-handed. 
using unmarked vehicles to detain protesters, removing them without explanation for the arrests. It prompted Oregon's Attorney General to sue. America's first Homeland Security Secretary says their presence is making normal policing more difficult. They may make a few arrests, be good for TV, move out, and uh, the mayors and the governors and the, and the attorneys and the law enforcement officials are going to have to deal with it all over again. According to Homeland Security, U.S. laws relating to the protection of government buildings justifies federal officers being sent in. We are there to protect the federal courthouse. We have that responsibility given to us by the United States Congress. We are on that federal property and we are protecting that federal property. Mayor Wheeler believes that argument is merely camouflaging blatant pre-election grandstanding by the president. The president is using these federal forces as his own personal militia. Ahead of another expected night of violence in Portland, a judge has barred law enforcement officers from arresting or using physical force against journalists or legal observers. John Baldock, SBS World News. Jewish rights activists have accused a German court of being too lenient on a former guard at a Nazi concentration camp. 93-year-old Bruno Dye was convicted of being an accessory to more than 5,000 murders at the Stutthof camp in what was then occupied Poland. He was just 17 years old at the time and maintained during his nine-month trial that he had not been aware of the extent of the atrocities committed there. Dye was found guilty and given a two-year suspended sentence, which means he won't spend any time behind bars. Human rights activists in Jerusalem have described the verdict as misplaced sympathy and a stain on the process of Holocaust justice. Unfortunately, Mr. Day is going to laugh all his way to his home, where he will uh, continue his regular life. And the survivors are left with their nightmares, they're left with the sorrow, they're left with the terrible dreams. Because he was a teenager during his time in Stutthof, Day's trial was heard in a juvenile court. To mark a year since he became Prime, Prime Minister of Britain, Boris Johnson has taken a trip to Scotland, a place where he's not particularly popular. Support for Scottish independence has surged amid Brexit concerns and the COVID-19 pandemic. A crabby start to Boris Johnson's Scottish roadshow. A beautiful thing, it's such a beautiful thing. It's big, it's proud, isn't it? His trip to the very north of the country was to promote the benefits of unity in a not so united kingdom. Where's, where's your mask, Boris? Calls for Scottish independence are growing louder, but Mr Johnson insists he won't allow another public vote on the issue. We had a, a referendum in, in 2014. It was decisive. Uh, it was, I think, by common consent, uh, a once-in-a-generation event. In that referendum, only 44.7% of Scottish voters backed independence, a clear victory for unionists and the British government. But a poll taken earlier this month found 54% now want Scotland to become an independent country. So what has changed so many hearts and minds? For one thing, according to nationalists, the UK government's handling of the coronavirus crisis. You can see from the statistics that we have really driven down by the virus in Scotland. There's been great public buy-in to the measures of the Scottish government. And people in many respects are contrasting the very strong leadership we've given to what people, what commentators often talk about as the bluff and bluster for Boris Johnson. The Prime Minister pointing to how much cash his Treasury has spent to help Scotland through the pandemic. What we've seen throughout this crisis is the importance of and the strength of the union in, in dealing with certain crucial, crucial things. Uh, supporting people through the, the furlough scheme, uh, the, the work of, as I say, of the army and, and the armed services in, uh, in, in, in testing in, in moving people around. The other great driver of support to the nationalist cause is Brexit. We've really benefited from the freedom of movement, uh, EU citizens amongst others that have come to work here. And that door's been slammed shut. Scots voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union and many hoped that an independent Scotland would be able to rejoin the bloc of nations. An appealing prospect for some as the UK's post-Brexit free trade deal negotiations with Brussels hit another wall. The UK did not show a willingness to break the deadlock. Uh, if you do not reach an agreement on our future partnership, there will be far more friction. So there has been movement, but the gaps are still significant and we have to try and move forward in the next month or two.
Both sides will keep talking, but the post-Brexit transition period ends on New Year's Day and businesses will need time to prepare for whatever the new trading relationship looks like. In London, Ben Lewis, SBS World News. 1.3 billion tonnes of plastic pollution could be dumped on land and in the sea around the world for the next 20 years. That's according to new computer modelling, which shows a radical effort will be needed to slow down the production and disposal of plastic waste. It is everywhere because it's almost endlessly useful. And when it's thrown away, if plastic finds its way into a plant like this, a lot of it can be made into something useful all over again. It could be bottles that you buy from the supermarket. Um, it could be household furniture. Um, it could be garden furniture or composite decking. But every year, more and more plastic waste ends up here. And a global team of scientists has now tracked the production and disposal of plastic all around the world and used that information to forecast the scale of our plastic pollution problem for the next 20 years. If you uh, were to uh, count all together all the plastic waste that is going to be released into the environment, both on land and reaching the seas, these would be the staggering number of 1.3 billion tonnes of plastic. And 1.3 billion tonnes is so big of a number, it's almost unimaginable. How can you even visualise how much waste that is? If you were to spread this on um, a thin layer of land, it would be 1.5 times the size of the UK. Household waste, the scientists say, is by far the biggest source of all this pollution. They calculated that every year, 30 million tonnes is dumped on land, Nearly 50 million tonnes is burned out in the open, and that's in addition to the 10 million tonnes that finds its way into our oceans. Many of us might do our bit with reusable water bottles and coffee cups, but there's an estimated 2 billion people in the global south who have no access to any formal waste collection. They're simply left to work out what to do with all their rubbish. That's why waste collection is such a vital part of this, just making sure that everyone's household waste is collected, sorted, and that it's channeled to plants like this is the best way to make sure that it doesn't end up in the environment. Providing protection and safe employment for workers in low-income countries who collect and sort all of that waste will be just as important globally as reducing the production of single-use plastic. And while these new figures are daunting, the researchers say that recognising the source and the scale of this problem is the first step in stemming the worldwide tide of plastic pollution. Behrouz Bouchani, a Kurdish-Iranian journalist, human rights defender, writer and film producer, and for six years a little-known detainee on Manus Island. But last year, the 37-year-old's plight drew global attention when his book won Australia's richest literary prize. He was granted a one-month visa to speak in New Zealand last November, where he then made an application for asylum. That request has today been approved. The writer in him says, although this chapter of his life is over, the saga continues for those still living in immigration detention. Eight months after arriving in New Zealand, a fresh start. I feel that it is an end of a chapter of my life and it is a beginning of a new chapter. New Zealand recognising Beirouz Bachani as a refugee and granting him a visa, exactly seven years to the day after he sought asylum in Australia. The news coming on his 37th birthday, though for him it's bittersweet. How can I fully enjoy that and be happy while I can see the people who I know them, I know their stories. They have uh, been traumatised for a long time. Still, they are there. Mr Bachani was detained on Manus Island after fleeing persecution in Iran in 2013. For six years, he became a voice for hundreds of other detainees, chronicling conditions of the camp in a book that won him the Victorian Premier's Literary Award in 2018. That book led him to New Zealand on a temporary visa last year to speak at a writer's festival. He lodged a claim for protection when he arrived, which has now been recognised. 
It's a decision that is long overdue and it's a vindication for Beirut. New Zealand has offered to accept 150 asylum seekers from Australia's offshore detention centres on Manus Island and Nauru, but the two governments have not reached a deal to do so. Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton has previously said that accepting the offer would create a back door into Australia for refugees who become New Zealand citizens. The Australian government should have taken that up uh, many years ago when it was offered back in 2015 and it should urgently take up that offer now. More than 370 asylum seekers remain on Manus Island and Nauru. Beirut's Bachani says he'll continue to fight for them. They are a part of this story. They are a part of this journey. The Department of Home Affairs was approached for comment. Nakari Thorpe, SBS World News. To the economy now, and the government could be in for a bit of a windfall a day after it unveiled the largest budget deficit projection since World War II. SBS finance editor Ricardo Gonsalves joins us in the studio now. Ricardo, that's because iron ore export values have hit a record. Anton, and that's despite the global coronavirus pandemic. Now, the Bureau of Statistics says the total value of exports out of Australia rose 8% to $31.6 billion in June, but a third of that was just iron ore. It's going to come up soon. The graphic, there you go, it's coming up. A record $9.9 .9 billion worth was shipped out, up 8%, the bulk of that going to China. Huge government stimulus in the country to keep people in work during the outbreak has prompted vast numbers of infrastructure projects which requires iron ore. That, along with supply disruptions, has pushed the price of the commodity to more than $100 US a tonne. The government, however, has factored in an iron ore price of 55 US by the end of the year because of economic uncertainty. If prices remain high, it means greater than anticipated tax receipts for the government. There's certainly no doubt we will have to see a continuation of the stimulatory uh, programs and the money being uh, pushed into the global economy. If that continues, and we're fairly sure that it will, because COVID is not going to uh, immediately disappear uh, and we do believe over the course of the next 12 months that it, it will probably remain very close to if not around its highs uh, for the foreseeable future. The Minerals Council says $12 billion in company tax revenue was generated by iron ore producers in the financial year 19. Australia's superannuation industry will continue to be hit because of the pandemic with dramatically fewer funds for future investment. Researchers at Rainmaker Information say super assets were projected to climb to $10 trillion over the next two decades. But COVID-19 has seen that revised down to $7 billion. It took into account the recession, rising unemployment and reduced population growth, namely migration. It also means we need to get every ounce of investment economic energy in this country working in the one direction. Almost $30 billion has been withdrawn by members accessing the early release of super scheme, which was extended to the end of the year in yesterday's budget update. Now, part of the update also included an extension to the JobKeeper and JobSeeker payments for a further six months. While the announcement was widely welcomed by industry groups, the latest spike in infections has prompted many small businesses to re-evaluate their viability beyond the pandemic. Jennifer Kennedy specialises in high-end weddings. On average, she would oversee 10 a year. But now, she has just one booking left in 2020, and it will likely be moved. My whole uh, company has gone down to one, which is me, uh, where I've had to um, put everyone on standby. We're all on JobKeeper. The extension of JobKeeper payments has provided her with much needed short term relief. I don't think I'm going to recover for another 18, to 18 months to 24 months post COVID. And that bounce back depends on restrictions easing in New South Wales. Weddings are now limited to 150 people, with no singing or dancing allowed. I come from a Mediterranean background. I mean, might as well just have a sit-down dinner and tell everyone to go home afterwards. Dancing is probably 30%, if not more, of a wedding reception. Businesses have been warned to keep on top of their finances as restrictions ease across the country. So they clearly need you know, to watch their, their revenue levels. But I mean, really what the government's talking about here is trying to get businesses back to some sense of normality as quickly as they possibly can. While the extension of JobKeeper and JobSeeker has been welcomed, 
payments will be reduced from late September. Consumer group Canstar says many are already preparing, with a third of Australians cutting back on spending. This is coming down the pipe really quickly for some people. Two and a half months and JobKeeper reduces by $300 per fortnight. So look, start working on it now. Think about now how you'll cope with that lesser figure. And people could save further by reassessing their electricity, car and health insurance providers. You could potentially save about $2,000 a year just by switching from an average premium to the lowest in the market. The JobKeeper scheme is set to expire in March next year. Adrian Archuli, SBS World News. OK, now to another one of the government stimulus measures, Home Builder, which appears to have triggered a land rush. REA Group says inquiries for land estates surged 93% in June after the measures were announced. And when taking into account new apartments and retirement properties, developer inquiries hit a record last month. It extends on an already strong rebound since March lows. We're already seeing uh, in May that the number of inquiries, particularly for new developments, had started to rise, but also for vacant land. And I think that's really linked to the fact that we were seeing consumer confidence rebounding quite rapidly. If we look at the six weeks since Home Builder was announced, there's been 3,854 vacant land sales nationally. And that's actually 62.5% higher than the number of sales we saw over the previous six weeks. So it's pretty clear that um, Home Builder has pulled a lot of demand into the market. Under the scheme, eligible applicants can access $25,000 to either build or significantly renovate a property. Rising US-China tensions put a dent on our share market today. The 200 fell 1.2% to be 2.2% lower for the week. The banks led the declines today. Insurance Australia Group tumbled after it scrapped its final dividend. Woolies was the only one of the top 20 stocks to finish higher today. The Australian dollar lost a bit of ground as investors moved away from risky assets buying just under 71 US and nearly $1.07 New Zealand. Emirates passengers will have their medical and quarantine expenses covered if they contract COVID-19 during their travel. It's a bid to help kickstart demand. Medical costs of up to $245,000 and quarantine costs of up to $160 a day for 14 days will be offered free of charge. And the company behind Coon Cheese will rebrand the product following complaints it had racist connotations. The brand's owner, Canadian-based Saputo, says it will develop a new name that aligns with current attitudes and perspectives. Activists have been campaigning for change for two decades and Anton, there is no word yet on that new name. Thanks, Ricardo. Coming up next, the next battleground. Russia accused of uh, firing an anti-satellite weapon into space. And was a US fighter jet responsible for this mid-air scare on a passenger plane? Tonight at 7.30, Secrets of the Railway. Then at 9.30, Mary Beard invokes new ideas about gender, sex and moral transgression in a bare-all two-part documentary, Mary Beard's Shock of the Nude. This is Tuskbuster. This necessary, is it? In this show, I make comedians do stupid things for me. Oh, my word. Eat as much watermelon as possible. You have one minute. Will you cheat again? Yep. No bad conditions for art. Taskmaster starts Monday, 8.30 on SBS Iceland and On Demand. Sleep by Max Richter. The ultimate relaxation album for a modern world. Out now. Stay healthy by staying informed and start the journey towards feeling your best with NIB. From tips to mentally recharge, to workouts at home, deliciously easy recipes, and how to access important health services. The Checkup is NIB's online content hub created by industry experts, full of ideas and inspiration for healthy living, and it's available to all Australians. Search NIB's The Checkup today. It's worth it. I've just got to find a place. Yeah. Just go somewhere quiet. Mom, do you want to ask you something? Yeah. Scroll on the 4,000. We've made changes for those who Wi-Fi in every room. Add on Telstra smart Wi-Fi boosters to any NBN plan. 
So what did you end up getting? I bought a Jeep. You bought a Jeep? Mm-hmm. And so did over 100,000 other Australians. But for some, owning a Jeep wasn't as enjoyable as driving one, which is why Jeep have now committed to cap price servicing and more dedicated technical specialists. So every driver is looked after. What do you think of that, Michael? Oh, man. Value tastes better when it's freshly made. Subway 6-inch subs. All this for only $5 with the Everyday Value range. All day, every day at Subway. We all have a fantasy. We all have a fetish. There isn't a person in the world without a secret. My grandmother always told me that if the dead weren't given a proper burial, they'd become ghosts. This isn't random, is it? Which means... It's going to be more. Our goal here is to find the source of the contamination. How am I going to let her know that her husband is having an affair? When you hear this chime, it means the SBS program you've started has audio description capabilities that can be turned on. Michael Patillo hails down an approaching train. Audio description fills in the gaps for people who are blind or vision impaired, so everyone can enjoy the full story. Lisa Wilkinson looks down in wonder at her family tree. That's amazing. To find out more, head to sbs.com.au forward slash audio description. Russia has been accused of launching a space weapon that could be used to sabotage other countries' space expeditions. Both the UK and the US have voiced concerns over a recent Russian satellite test, which they believe might actually be a weapon in orbit. Russia insists the new satellite is only performing checkups on its space equipment. Passengers on an Iranian plane have had a frightening mid-air moment when their pilot avoided a potential collision with the US fighter jet. The flight from Tehran to the Lebanese capital Beirut was serviced by privately owned Mahan Air. The pilot was forced to change altitude suddenly, sending panic throughout the aircraft. <laughs> Iranian media says that at least one US jet came close to the plane in Syrian airspace. The plane landed safely at its destination, but several passengers were left injured. A U.S. official says that an American fighter jet passed, but at a safe distance. Iran's foreign ministry said the incident would be investigated. Thousands of worshippers have gathered at Istanbul's Hagia Sophia for the first prayer since it was turned back into a mosque. The building holds a special significance for both Christians and Muslims. For centuries, it was an Orthodox Christian cathedral before becoming a mosque and then a museum. Greece and Christian church leaders have opposed Turkey's decision to change its status. Authorities say as many as 17,000 security personnel are on duty for the opening. To Sport Now and Ash Barty has been denied the chance to defend her season-ending championship. It follows the cancellation of 11 tournaments planned for China in October and November, including the WTA finals. Seven women's events and four men's titles have fallen victim to the coronavirus pandemic. Chinese officials confirm they will not reschedule any of those events. Cairns is set to be home to two AFL teams for three to four weeks. Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk confirmed a deal had been struck with the game's officials. Cairns Kazali Stadium will host three fixtures. The names of the two teams and the timing of the move are yet to be confirmed. While North Melbourne and Melbourne's clash will not take place on August the 9th in Hobart, it follows Tasmania's decision to keep its borders closed to people travelling from Queensland. Gymnastics Australia says it will continue to monitor cases of alleged mental and physical abuse within the sport. It comes after a former Australian athlete revealed she was emotionally abused to the point of considered, considering ending her own life at the age of 17. 2006 Commonwealth Games gold medalist Chloe Gilliland is one of over 20 former local gymnasts to raise allegations of fat shaming and a toxic culture. 
The NFL side, formerly known as the Redskins, will go by the, the name the Washington football team for at least the 2020 season. The club's logo will also be dropped. It follows complaints from Native American advocates. The team will still retain its colours. Mike Tyson will step back into the ring at the age of 54. Boxing's former undisputed world heavyweight champion will face Roy Jones Jr. in an exhibition bout in September. Uh, Tyson's training regime went viral recently on social media. The eight-round clash will be his first competitive fight in 15 years. Coming up, the weather and a record number of new Australians. Figures released exclusively to SBS World News reveal where our newest citizens hark from. How can you reconcile that in your head? We're going to tell this story. We're going to tell it right. We will change the course of history. SBS presents a series of films and documentaries all about making history. Starts tomorrow, 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. First victim's Paul Redford. This isn't random, is it? It's going to be more. Do you do remember how many crimes you've committed together? A new season of Luther starts Wednesday 9.30 on SBS and On Demand. I love a sunburnt country. A land of sweeping plains, of ragged mountain ranges, of droughts and flooding rains. I love her far horizons. I love her jewel sea. Her beauty and her terror, the wide brown land for me. Getting back on the road is something we're all looking forward to. And at Toyota, we're here to help you do just that. Get Kluger two-wheel drive GX from 41990 Drive Away. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota. I've been thinking. Change it up. No, stay the course. It's all about managing cash flow. Or is it investing diversified? Wait, why did I even get into this? Andy? Let's work through this one step at a time. If you need help working out your next step, search ANZ Business Planner. Did you know there's a paint that absorbs CO2 as it dries? Painting with Ecosphere is like transforming your home into a tree. Now that's a breath of fresh air. Better get to Crowley's, because at Crowley's, we know paint. With degrees in business and commerce, community services, fashion, arts and design, you can graduate with a qualification and the hands-on skills employers want. Search TAFE New South Wales degrees or call 131 601. Don't blink or you'll miss it. The Snooze Flash Sale is now on. Half price on selected mattresses and bed frames. Hurry, the countdown is on. Sale must end Sunday. It's amazing what a little snooze can do. In order for Lego, someone's in for some fun. Bet you love toys. You're childish. No, I'm not. <laughs> Eat as much watermelon as possible. You have one minute. Taskmaster starts Monday, 8.30 on SBS Iceland and On Demand. There's a world of stories available for free at SBS On Demand. Download the app or visit the website today. SBS On Demand, a world of difference. Checking the weather in the major centres now. Clear skies in Adelaide and Darwin. Overcast in Melbourne, Perth and Hobart. Morning frost and a low of just minus one in Canberra. Showers developing in Brisbane and Sydney. 
Looking further afield now, fine in Wellington, Christchurch and Nandi, showers in Samoa and Tahiti. In Southeast Asia, thunder in Bangkok, rain in Port Moresby and Honiara, partly cloudy in Denpasar and Jakarta. Further north, drizzle in Taipei and Hanoi, cloudy in Shanghai, Tokyo and Beijing, fine in Hong Kong. Heading west now, clear skies in Baghdad and Jerusalem, cloudy and 39 degrees in Tehran, rain in Mumbai and Delhi. On to Europe now, partly cloudy in Rome and Stockholm, sunny in Athens and Madrid, overcast in Berlin and Paris. In Africa, showers in Addis Ababa and Lagos, clear skies in Algiers, Cairo and Casablanca, cloud cover in Nairobi and Dakar. In South America, showers in Lima, Caracas and Bogota, thunderstorms in Panama City. And for North America, fog in Los Angeles, scattered showers in Vancouver and Havana, clear skies in New York and Toronto. Exclusive figures released to SBS World News reveal a record number of people became Australian citizens over the past 12 months. But the COVID-19 pandemic means the process is taking a little longer now. Today you become an Australian citizen. 11 new citizens from six different countries take the oath at an intimate ceremony in Canberra. A joyous moment, but hugs and handshakes were off limits. Good, very good. It will be a memorable thing in our life. We are waiting for this very long time. You know, through COVID-19, we've had to adapt and change, uh, where we've moved a lot of our ceremonies to online. Over 200,000 new citizens have taken the oath in the last financial year, 45,000 online. The backlog of approved candidates waiting to finalise the process has reduced by over 40% since the start of the year. By the end of the year, it will be down to zero and we'll just be dealing with the ongoing applicants as they come through. The 2019-2020 figure is the biggest increase of new citizens on record, 60% more than the previous year and more than double 2018, with the top three countries of origin, India, the UK and China. While the backlog of approved applicants is clearing, a further 140,000 people have an application pending. Citizenship tests and interviews have resumed in small numbers in some states and territories, including New South Wales and Western Australia. But for applicants in Victoria, the wait continues. And we want to be part of this country. We want, we want to feel that we belong here. Amul Jani came to Australia with his family in 2014. Applying for citizenship in Melbourne just before the COVID-19 outbreak. He's unsure when he'll be able to take the test, but says he's prepared to wait as long as it takes. Still feel we are part of this and we are all in it together. So, yeah, we'll just hope for the best. The current wait time for citizenship by conferral is 29 months. The government says it's working to speed up the process. Abby Dinham, SBS World News. Welcome to them all. Recapping our top stories now, Victoria has faced its deadliest day of the pandemic with another seven people dying, most of the deaths linked to aged care facilities. And China has retaliated over the closure of its consulate in Houston, Texas, ordering the shutdown of the US consulate in Chengdu. That's The World This Friday. If you missed some of tonight's bulletin, you can catch up on the SBS News website shortly. And a reminder, you can also watch the bulletin live there or on our app. Our next bulletin with Caterina Flores is at 10.45. Good night.